knowing how to run a business. And so very briefly, the truth is, um, I am primarily a business lawyer. Uh, and I've only been a lawyer for 10 years. So looking at the gray hair, you can see there's got to be a gap somewhere. And there was. When I got out of college, I started a business. And I ran that business for uh, almost 10 years. And by luck, and I assure you it was luck, I'd love to tell you it was part of a well thought out plan. But through a lot of luck and making a lot of mistakes that I'm going to try to help you get around today, uh, the business was very successful and I sold it and tried to figure out what the next phase was. And in a weak moment I decided to uh, become a mediator and ultimately that led to going to law school. But what's important for our purposes today is that when I counsel clients on their businesses, when I help them either going into business or more often than not, as you all know, getting out of their businesses, I find myself drawing more on my experience as a business owner than as a lawyer. Because when you look back at law school, what did we learn about running a business in law school? We learned about organizations, putting them together. But in terms of the day-to-day -day business, we didn't learn a lot. And to be honest with you, some of the most poorly run businesses that I've seen are law firms, you know, some of the ones with the highest rates of uncollectible receivables, some of them with the most difficult and challenging employment uh, situations, very often are law firms. And I only know this because we've had many of them as clients. So I'd love to hear if you disagree with me. This is intended to be a, an interactive program. I really don't want to stand here and talk for an hour. But I'm just going to go over a couple of basic points. And um, for those of you that either have your own practices or you're thinking of having your own practices, just want to talk about some of the basics. And uh, we'll go over that. So first of all, if you're thinking of having your own business, whatever that business is, and some of you may be uh, thinking of doing other businesses, so I'm going to talk a little more broadly today. The first question is, why would you bother? Why would you want to go out and have your own business? Why would you want to be self-employed? Well, most people will say, I want to be my own boss. You know, I want that independence. I want to be able to go out and call my own shots. Um, it's the pathway to riches. It's the only way to really be rich, to really go out there and make the real money. Um, there are all sorts of ideas that people come up with. I'm sure that you have plenty of your own. But the reality is, as we know, is that when you own your own business, you have that business around the clock. You know, that idea of that independence, yeah, if I have my own business, I'm my own boss, I can come in at 10, I can leave by 2, I can check in from the ninth hole on my cell phone. But what's really happening? When I had my first business, when we were reaching out to the business customers, we'd advertise at 3 o'clock in the morning because we'd know that they were sitting up there glassy-eyed watching the, tele the television. That was the best time to catch them watching ads on TV because they don't sleep. They lie awake all night. They don't have a time clock. There's no such thing as overtime. What time do you go home? I'm talking to a room full of lawyers, and so they don't watch a time clock anyway. But normal people usually go home at 5 or 6 o'clock at night. They're not used to working until 8 o'clock. But self-employed people don't know that. Instead of having no bosses, you actually have lots of bosses. Everyone is looking to you. The buck stops with you. So your customers are looking to you. The employees are counting on you. You get that phone call from the bank. Hey, by the way, um, did you have a chance to make that deposit yesterday? So all of a sudden, those realities are, are kicking in. Everyone's looking to you. And riches, well, how'd that work out for you? Because when do you get paid? After everybody else. Exactly. After everybody else has gotten paid. You don't 
have a guaranteed paycheck. If you haven't signed the front of a paycheck, it's hard to really appreciate that, but that's what happens. You get paid last. So why do people do it? That's what happens anyway. So the reality is a lot of businesses end up failing um, at the end of the day. And so why does that happen? You've all heard the statistics. The majority of businesses fail. Well, the first reason that that happens is because people go in, they put seconds, thirds on their homes for the few people who have equity left in their homes. They borrow from relatives. They found out all those realities. And they've said, wow, this is really not working out for me. I'm closing the business. Or maybe it isn't their choice about closing the business. <clears throat> The second reason is insufficient business management skills with emphasis on business. And the third reason is lack of proper planning. So I'm going to take a look at those one at a time. And then we're going to get into the actual business planning itself. That's why. So the first is there are three types of business management skills you need to be successful in your business. And the first one I like to call technical. The technical business management skills. And these are the skills that are industry specific. Everybody needs to have that. So if you're going to run a law firm, you probably ought to know something about the law. If you're going to run an automotive shop, you ought to know the difference between a crankshaft and a crankcase. You've got to have that kind of basic knowledge. All right. The other one is generic business knowledge. Those things that are universal to every business. Every business has to understand about what their compliance obligations are. They have to understand accounting got to account for things. There are <clears throat> basics that are going to be true to any business. You name a business and those things are going to have to be done for your business. And then finally you've got what I call the entrepreneurial. Those things are that are business specific. What is specific to your business? Who are you going to have to sell to? What is the product that's going to work for them? What hours do you need to stay open? The minimum number of hours per week. Do you need to be open on the weekend? Those kinds of things. So you've got to have those skills to be successful in your business. Now, it might surprise you to know that out of all of these, this is actually the least important to your business. You can hire this. You can go out and open a bakery and hire a really good baker. And if you know business operations and accounting and you can run your business well, and you have a good handle on who your market is and the things we're going to talk about today, you can run that business if you can hire somebody who really understands the baking side of your bakery. And I don't think intuitively that's something most people think about. So why else would the business fail? And that's what we're here for today, and that's the lack of proper planning. So how do you do proper planning? The way that you choose to do proper planning, it's much the same as if you were going on any trip. So you take out a picture of the United States, of course, that's how you start off. <coughs> when you decide to go on a trip, the very first thing you do is what? Exactly. You decide where you're going to go. Because if you decide to go to Seattle, or you decide to go to Miami, you're going to take a different path, aren't you? 
your route is going to be different. You're going to go to MapQuest, you're going to go to Google Maps. Uh, if you're really traditional, you're going to dig out an old map if you can remember how to unfold and use one of those. You're going to first select your destination and then you're going to decide how to get there. Now what's interesting is that not everyone has the same destination in mind for their businesses. And just to illustrate that, I'm going to point out a couple of different examples. You think, oh, everyone goes into business for the same reason. They want to run a business, they want to make money. Simple. Well, how about some other ideas? What if somebody has one of those fancy uh, PERS retirement programs, they're 50 years old, they're taking home 200000 a year, and they get bored because they're too young to retire. So they go out and decide to buy a business so that they've got something to do every day. Their goal is going to be different. Are they going to be as financially motivated? Maybe. But maybe they're going to buy a hobby business. So when they set up their business plan, their priorities are going to be different than somebody else. What about the entrepreneur who goes into business and is looking to the third and fourth generation behind her? She's looking to set up for her children so that her children and those children's children will have that business forever. I just read in the Chronicle on Sunday, Sherman and Clay is going out of business. I grew up in San Francisco and I remember you know, I went to school downtown at NDV. There was a Sherman and Clay down on the corner of Kearney Street. And it wasn't quite 142 years ago, but it was a good chunk out of their 142 years ago. Um, Sherman and Clay was just a mainstay in San Francisco. And out, after 142 years, and I think they said six generations, that company's going out of business. I and mean, it really you know, it was kind of painful to read that. But of course, it was inevitable. Um, in this day and age with all the options. And then I saw the price of some of their pianos. Marked down from 159,000 to 138,000, you could buy this Steinway something or other. Anyway, so legacy might be an option uh, for some people. During the dot-com boom, you know, people were jumping in and jumping out of businesses. Buy it low, sell it high, and the next week you go do another one. What's their business plan? They're not going to own it long enough to have a business plan, right? Uh, necessity. There are a lot of people in the last couple of years who went out and bought themselves a job. Couldn't get hired. So what do you do? <coughs> you, you take out the equity in that house. You go out and buy yourself a pool rack. You know, you had engi computer engineers servicing pools, driving cabs, bought a cab. So you had a lot of people who had gone and bought themselves a job. Um, Fixer-uppers. A lot of people will go in and buy a business that's really down and out that they think they can fix up. And similar to the flash, but they hold it longer. And then you have the dreamer, the person that just simply insists on being their own boss. Now, it's not significant that you know all these, but I'm just trying to expand your mind to realize that different people will have different goals and every one of them will have a different approach. Their destination is going to be different. And their approach will be different when they're doing their business plan. And I encourage you, when you do yours, to think very, very thoughtfully about what your personal destination is, where you are in life, what you want to do with your business, where you fit on this. And maybe you're here or you're here. And you've got something I haven't even thought of. I'm sure there are plenty of things that you could put up there. But whatever that's going to be, make sure you understand that before you even put pen to paper or finger to keyboard when you're doing your business plan. All right, so once you've decided all of that, you want to uh, start working on your plan and getting the mouse to work. plan. Okay. So when you're actually putting the plan together, 
this is actually going to be a time when you are going to really focus on your business more than you'll ever have a chance to do. It's like contemplating your, your corporate navel. You're never ever going to have another opportunity to spend this much time with the minutia of the operating uh, facets of your business. And so this is a great time to really evaluate that. And what's interesting is most of the time when you do this, you're going to find that the end result, what you end up doing, the end product, the work product, looks absolutely nothing like you originally thought it would when you started to put this together. So don't be surprised if that happens. That will be a good thing. Um, realize that the final plan is going to be something that you can share. You can share it with your lenders. Uh, when you go looking for money, if you go looking for money, maybe a credit line for your law firm or whatever you're going to be doing. Um, potential investors or partners that might be coming into the business. And also with your employees. One of the things it does is it helps others realize that you have a vision and you've thought this thing through. You can share your objectives. It's almost like um, when you put a partnership agreement together, there's no question. Everyone understands what the rules are. They understand what the expectations are. It's the same with a business plan as it pertains to your business. <clears throat> so if you want to go ahead and follow, I'm going to go ahead and just go through what the components are. Hopefully this will be helpful to you. So, there is nothing that you will find that is hard and fast about what a business plan should look like. I've just found this to be a very effective and efficient method of putting together a business plan, uh, both for the author and for those with whom you share it. First of all, I'd like to do an executive summary. The executive summary is more, no more than a paragraph or two that summarizes what is in the business plan. Now, you don't want to put too much in the executive summary because then the people will not have any need to read the rest of the business plan. You really want them to share in what you have in there. So I write the executive summary last and it summarizes what's in the plan. You may want to put something in there about who the uh, key stakeholders are, who the key employees are, the primary purpose of the company, just some things like that. It's not anything that's you know, a brilliant piece of prose, uh, but it's just a summation of what is to come. Next is the table of contents. <coughs> Hopefully I don't have to explain that. Now this is important. A mission statement, it may sound very California, very esoteric, we're all gonna sit around and you know think about this in this great cosmic sense. But actually a mission statement is a really good thing to do. A mission statement will help you stay focused, help you stay focused on what the vision is for your company. Um, Generally, what happens is that companies will put these together <coughs> and it's something that can be referred back to. It's something that's shared with others. When you, for instance, if in your mission statement you talk about being a criminal law firm and one of your partners comes in and says, hey, I just met this person at lunch. And it looks like we can get this contract with this insurance company that's going to give us this great opportunity to have 50 cases a month defending all of their PI uh, claims that come in. You go back to your mission statement. That's inconsistent with your mission. So at that point, you either need to change your mission, rethink the direction of your firm, or you need to say, that's not what we do. So it's again, helps you to maintain a particular focus. It's a reality check for your firm. I'll give you an example of one that um, I've always liked. I thought it really summed it up. The DuPont company, huge conglomerate, says, 
The mission of DuPont is to provide better things for better living through chemistry. Mission statement is not a paragraph. It's like 20 words, you know, 15, 20 words, one sentence, very little punctuation, but it just sums up so someone can look and say, oh, why does this law firm exist? It's almost like a tagline. It's like something you could put into your marketing. But it really is powerful in that it helps you maintain focus and share with the world what the purpose of your company is. Are there any questions on any of this? I'm doing way more talking than I was hoping to. Any thoughts on mission statements? Anyone? You're attorney. You're supposed to argue with me. Does anybody think this is a horrible idea? Well, what if you, you want a broad mission statement because you're not quite sure exactly what you want to practice? Then you'll do a hell of a job convincing everyone that you have no idea why you're in business and you will just be open to everything. Well, what's wrong with that? <laughs> is there? I don't know. I mean, there's more opportunity. Are you saying if, if, if a case comes in and it doesn't fit my mission statement, I send it away? No, actually, and I'm really, I'm giving you a bad time, but I'm glad you asked that, because if that's how you're going to run your company, <coughs> your firm, then you would have a mission statement that would address that. The mission of XYZ and Associates is to be available to all those in need of professional legal services in a cooperative environment that encourages blah, blah, blah. So it would be broad enough to allow you to do that because that's important to you. It may not be important to someone else that wants to target doing something else, a boutique firm that is going to specialize in doing a you know, asbestos or a construction defect or a particular type of law. So it's going to be different for everyone. The only thing that I think is important is that it be consistent with whatever you're going to do. If you want to go broader, then you go broader and you don't be afraid to say it up front. But do what you say and say what you do. Just have there be a, not be a disconnect there. Anything else? Okay, yes. Since you asked a question, when a business management deal, I'm having a hard time with reading the detail that the technical skills were not as important. And in some businesses, I can see that. And just because you use a criminal attorney, I'm going to say with that, I see the technical skills being just as important as the business model. I'm not sure that everyone heard that question. Um, what is your name? Zephyr. Zephyr. Okay, Zephyr asked the question about. She's struggling with the concept that the technical skills are not as important as the rest of the skills. And I believe you're relating it more to the law firm, within the law firm environment. Now, first of all, this is an exception because obviously in California, um, we have to be lawyers to own a law firm in the first place. So we better have legal knowledge. We better have the legal technical knowledge. <clears throat> Because this class is focused on running a business, and I'm trying to put the emphasis on the business side of running a law firm, I'm trying to communicate to you that within the generic business environment, it's more important to the running of your business that you have the generic business knowledge and the specific understanding of that which is unique to your business for the purposes of running your business, more so than you having to be the best criminal lawyer that it is. That, the best criminal lawyer, okay? If you were faced with running a criminal law firm and you were the best at accounting and everything it took to operationally handle that business and you understood it, 
and you had the ability to hire, uh, who's a great, I don't do criminal law, so who's a great criminal lawyer that we should all know? Garagos. Garagos? Yeah. Okay, Garagos. If you could hire Garagos and you knew that that was handled within your firm, and you absolutely had the other two under control, that would be more important because that part would be handled. You can't let the others get away from you, though. Now, a law firm, again, is not the best example because obviously you've got to take care of that. That's why I use the example of a bakery or a law firm. See, let me go back to the bakery example real quickly. If somebody is a really, really good baker and they're tired of getting paid, you know, $15 an hour or whatever they get paid, they make a decision one day to go open a bakery. They say, I've had it with this, so I'm going to go open a bakery. And they save up their money, and they go out, and they open that bakery. And the very first day that they open the door, they're sitting there, and they want to go bake everything, but they suddenly realize, oh, gosh, I've got to figure out now if I want DSL or if I want cable. Oh, my gosh, did I remember to put the ad in the phone book? Did I, uh, did I pay the rent? Oh, did I call the bank and order the checks? Did I call the health department? Did I call the city? Uh, because I have to get my license set up. And then, oh gosh, I've got to order a delivery truck. I forgot to do that. And they're going down this, this list of all these things that have to be done. They forgot to order the Quicken. They forgot to get their EIN. All these things they have to do. They may make the best cake in the world, but all those things that they're required to do in opening that bake shop have nothing to do with knowing how to bake a cake. And when you open your law firm, it's no different. You've got to walk in that door, you've got to make sure the furniture is ordered, that the time slips has been ordered, you've got the computers up, you've got the internet up, all this stuff. And you may be the best person in the world in the courtroom, but everything you have to do to get your business set up has nothing to do with being the best criminal lawyer in Contra Costa County. And that's my point. It has nothing to do with producing the product, but you're only talking about running the business. They're two different things. And the sooner we understand that they're two different skills, the better we're going to be as business people, as lawyers. We can be really good lawyers and really good business people, and we can be both. But we've just got to understand that they're different skills. I mean, the dirty little secret we all know is once you pass the bar, and every time you go to a cocktail party, everyone seems to think that you now know everything because you're a lawyer. I love it. You know, somebody comes up, I think one of the most empowering things is somebody asks me a legal question, I say, I really have no idea. Because I don't. You know, the pleading and practice is what, 53 volumes at 1,000 pages each? Anybody that thinks they know that, good luck. But anyway, so I hope that answers that. So, that's enough on mission statements, but um, now I'm even confused. All right, let's go ahead. So moving forward, um, the next section that you want to address will be the ownership and the legal matters. And this is fairly basic for you. Um, the only thing that I would say here is if you're going to buy an existing practice, some of you may, put something in the business plan about how long it's been in business. If you've got some key employees, you're keeping you know, what position they have, how long they've been there, those kinds of things. And then are you going to be an LLP? Are you going to be a general partnership? Are you going to be a sole proprietor? How are you going to handle that? What is going to be the ownership share of the partners? Are you going to have equity partners, associates? Are you going to have any independent contractors, any of counsel? Address kind of those things. Depending on where you are, you may have certain licensing, permitting, some approvals, registrations that are required. Again, these things are helpful to you to have there. It's almost like a checklist. So if you think to do these things, then it will help you as you're getting your business going to know that 
oh gosh, that's something I've got to do. I've got to call the fire department and tell them we're here. You know, they won't want extension cords running down the hallway. They, they'll want to make sure we have a fire extinguisher here by the copy machine. Oh, you bought a Rico too. Um, okay. Now, I'm going to go into this section. And at the end of the day, if you did nothing other than this, this would be fabulous for you to, fabulous exercise for you. Because your business plan, if you know this much about your business, you're really going to be ahead of 90% of the people doing business. What is your product going to be? In this case, your services. What is it you're going to sell? <coughs> who are you going to sell it to? And who else is selling to the same people? And by association, how are you going to do better than they are at it? I'm going to go through those three. So first of all, I'm just going to put these up here. Better try this surprise you. And again, I have this laid out this way because it applies to more than law firms. But I'm going to relate it to a law firm. Main supplier. Some of you may, within a law firm, have certain suppliers of business. Some of you may work with certain insurance companies. You may work with a bail bonds person. You may have other attorneys that are constant referral sources. Think about those. You may want to put in there who those people are, who those companies are, and identify them in here. Um, what is the frequency of that supply? You may want to put that in there as well. Do you have any exclusivity agreements? Again, if you're doing insurance defense work, uh, I just mediated a case the other day with a major fast food company, and there's a, uh, they're insured by CNA. And the attorney who has the law office of, we'll call him John Smith, I just assumed that he had a couple of cases with them, but his email address was actually johnsmith at cna.com. I mean, his whole law firm exists to do nothing but apparently represent this insurance company and from what I can tell, this fast food company must have an awful lot of cases. Um, so, in his case, he would have exclusivity agreements. Are there any unique aspects to your company, to your firm? For instance, um, if before you went to law school you were a geologist, and now you are suddenly only going to focus on certain cases involving construction defects that involve soil conditions. Put something like that in there. That would also fit under competitive advantages. Competitive advantages I'm going to talk about in a minute. It goes so far beyond what our initial reaction is. We'll talk about that. And then expansion opportunities. If you're a family lawyer, are you doing a lot of prenuptials? Have you thought of marketing postnuptials agreements? Um, so, products and services. This is a great exercise for you to do for yourself as well. What are some of the uh, products you're selling? What makes them really good products for you? And what are some of the expansion opportunities that you might have? So get out there what it is that you're selling, what it is that you have to market. And then take a look at who it is that you're selling to. What I like to do is I like to start out with the circle. I start out with where are my customers? Where, are, where is my market? Yes, I have cases right now in San Diego. Yes, I have cases in Sacramento. And that doesn't mean because I define my market geographically as being in four counties that I'm not going to take a case that ends up down there. But realistically, am I going to devote any marketing dollars in San Diego? I don't think so. Because at the end of the day, you're trying to figure out where you're going to put your money. Um, so the first thing is, <coughs> geographically, demographically, where is your market? And I call it wholesale and retail, 
But this gets back to the concept, your wholesale are your major suppliers. If you've got an insurance company or someone like that who's using you a lot, um, your retail, of course, your, your onesies, twosies that come in, your off-the-street customers that are coming in quite a bit. How price sensitive is your market? And again, what are those expansion opportunities? So it's a lot easier uh, to use the example, if I own a pizza parlor, I'm selling pizza, well, it's a no-brainer that I'm going to do breadsticks, salads, and Cokes. If you're a law firm, and you know one of the ones that we always think of is if we do a trust administration or a probate, and we suddenly have people who had no money who now have money, what is a natural opportunity there with the beneficiaries? Thank you. Estate plans. When we do family law, and you know Helen Peters? Helen was the, right. Helen works with our firm and does uh, uh, family law. Well, you know, whether somebody had an estate plan or didn't have an estate plan before uh, they went through this traumatic event in their life, they're going to need one coming out of it, right? Because circumstances have changed. So there's an estate plan opportunity. I mean, not that we're trying to take advantage of these people in these situations. But we, they truly do need them at that in those circumstances. So always be looking for those, and, and those are some of the things that you want to go ahead and put in uh, in your business plan. Now, the competitive analysis is very very telling for you if you really do it correctly. Because the competitive analysis will help you go back and work on your products and services and your market. See, these three, it's kind of a working plan. You keep going back and forth on these until you get it just where you want it. So really take a look at what the firm across the street or down the hall is doing. How are they marketing themselves? What are they selling? What are they really, really good at? And is that a niche that you want a piece of, or is it something you choose to stay away from? It'll help you decide what your product line is going to be. What competitive advantages do you have? Did any of you see that uh, great movie with George Clooney, where he's a lawyer, and he's got the <coughs> super secret uh, premarital agreement that nobody had ever broken? It was a great movie. I just saw it yeah. recently. With uh, uh, is it Catherine Zeta Jones? Yes. yes, yes. And it's a great movie, and it all centers around he's got this great premarital agreement that nobody had ever done. It's his name. It's like the, the Murphy premarital agreement. Ironclad. So, and it was copyrighted. That was it, too. It was copyrighted uh, uh, PMA. So, do you have anything like that that you want to put in there? Do you have any competitive disadvantages? Are you located in a bad place? Um, I don't know. There's a lot of things that can be construed as disadvantages. You show up in the newspaper for really bad reasons. <laughs> so things that uh, you need to overcome. Identify your primary competitors and how do they compete, and then decide how you're going to compete. Now, this is always one of my favorite parts. How do people compete? How are you going to compete? How do people compete? Right. Uh, love that one. Thank you. <laughs> so Nordstrom competes. Neiman Marcus down here competes on price. Has anyone walked into Neiman Marcus here recently? Shocking. I, it's a wonderful store. Incredible quality. Made the mistake of walking in and looking at it for a sweater about two months ago. I'm not kidding. It was 
just wanted a sweater. Like $650. I mean, I could have like five more zeros in my bank account and I would not pay $650 bucks for a sweater. I couldn't believe it. But they're busy and they're doing well. And so I don't think they're competing on price. But price is certainly one of them. But that shows you that's one way to compete, but it's not the only way. Experience. So what else? Experience. Experience is a great one. Anything else? Service. Service. Really good. Nordstrom for years did that. Has done that. Any others? Flexibility. Very good one. Very good one. Who said that? You said that one. Thank you. I heard it over there somewhere. Flexibility. For attorneys, that's a brilliant one. I have one client, every time he calls, it's, um, can you meet me Saturday? I can't get off work. Can you guys meet me on Saturday morning, maybe around, oh, I don't know, 8? Sure, we'll meet you. Flexibility. That's a really strong one. You meet these people at night, weekends. Anything else? How are you going to compete? Well, yes. What do you think about alternative theory as far as bundling? Is that something we should be considering? I think it's good and I think it's complex. It's hard to market. Because remember, we come back to the fact we know what you're going to sell, who you're going to sell it to, and who else is doing it, so we know how you're going to sell it. But now you've got to sell it. And it's got to be simple. It can't be too complex. And so in your marketing, if you start advertising, we'll unbundle you. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's tough. It's good. It's good as a product line, but it would be tough to market. Maybe it fits into the flexibility part. Right. Exactly. Anything else? How about bilingual? Bilingual is really a good one these days. That's very important. Um, credit, your payment policies, things like that. Even as simple as offering to take credit cards is a real motivator for a lot of uh, businesses, or excuse me, clients. Your, um, the technology that you offer, your ability to communicate with these clients uh, electronically is important to many of them. So think about those kinds of things because those are important. All right, next is your operational analysis. Talk a little bit about uh, your hours of operation, things like that. Who are going, who, who's going to handle your uh, outside accounting, if you're going to have any, any kind of your uh, payroll services you may have, staffing services, professional services. Um, how about your insurance? E&O insurance, malpractice insurance, anything like that. Those kinds of things. Anything operationally that you think is important. You're going to have uh, <coughs> your staff, personnel, and org chart. And you know what? When you start out, you may have your name in every one of these. <laughs> but have the job title. You know, um, managing partner, uh, partners, associates, paralegals, whatever you're going to put in there. You may have your name in them. But eventually, you may have others, other names in there as you move along. Um, these are just some basics. Your facilities. Talk about any limitations, what you anticipate. The, um, the limits will be on those facilities, how long you can keep them. They will take you up to X number of lawyers or X amount of business. Um, the equipment that you have, whether it's owned or leased, things like that. I like to put in any key contacts that the business has in terms of uh, people that can help the business. Do you know a banker that's going to be available to you? Are you involved in um, Kiwanis, Seraptic? anything like that. Do you have contacts in the computer industry that might be able to get you 
some assistance. Again, you know some bail bonds persons who might be able to flip you some business. Then, <clears throat> this is really important, your financial information. Any budgets that you've laid out, that you've set forth in there. Um, your projections for the first year. Now, obviously, these are working documents. They're subject to being amended as you need to. Don't be afraid to do that. But, again, this helps you as much as it's going to help anyone who's going to look at it. Uh, don't hide your head in the sand. You know, understand that six months out, you may not have made any money. Uh, your receivables may be behind. You need to know if it's if you're going to need to have fifty thousand dollars on hand to take you through the through the first three months or six months. You need to know that. This is a good time to find that out, not in the fourth month. And um, the timetable. I'll show you a timetable in just a second. And then at the end, I always put in, in a resume of the key uh, employees and also the principals that are involved. This is very helpful. If you're working for someone else and you're planning to uh, open your firm soon, this is a sample of just a timetable that you might want to consider using. Just an Excel spreadsheet. You've got your startup date right here, 30 days before, 60 days before, 90 days before, 30 after, 60 after. Just put your tasks down the side here. Then something like, oh, sign the lease on the property, 90 days out, complete my financing, my credit lines, get the website up and going, hire my staff, 30 days out, the announcements, the press release on the start date, have a grand opening event, 30 days out, and boy, two months out, I'm lying on a beach somewhere. So that's the general idea. <coughs> So I've tried to throw this together pretty quickly for you. We have time for a couple of questions. Uh, it's a lot of information to throw at you, but I just wanted to give you kind of an overview of why you should plan and how you should plan, and uh, hopefully that